Hello and good morning. Um, it's morning here, December 1st, 2020. Perhaps it's afternoon or evening or sometime in between wherever you may be. Um, I am starting my day um, with this book, A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, a reference guide to more than 700 topics discussed by the early church fathers, David W. Burkott, editor. This is a book that I believe I got at an evangelical bookstore. However, many Orthodox um, clergy and lay people I know that have this book, and I would assume that the same would be um, for um, Roman Catholics as well. I don't truly really know. I have a very limited amount of Roman Catholic friends. However, um, Let's just uh, get into this book and see what we have to discover um, from some of the early fathers of the church and early Christian thought. Um, so, a dictionary of early Christian beliefs. Put my glasses on here as so I'd be prepared to read for you. A dictionary of early Christian beliefs. Interest in the ways of the early church has never been more intense. What did early Christians believe about the divinity of Christ? What did they think about the resurrection? What did they regard John the Baptist? What were the beliefs of those who sat at the feet of Jesus' disciples? Now, for the first time, a unique dictionary has been developed to furnish ready answers to these questions and others like them. David W. Burkott has painstakingly combed the writings of these early church leaders and categorized the heart of their thinking into more than 700 theological, moral, and historical topics to create a dictionary of early Christian beliefs. Wonderfully suited for devotional or thematic study as well as sermon illustration, this resource offers a window into the world of the early church and affords a special opportunity to examine topically the thoughts of men like Clement of Rome, Ignatius, or Polycarp, who were students of or the original apostles, as well as the thoughts of other great lights in the early church, such as Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and Tertullian. For anyone interested in historic Christianity, this cannot be overlooked. Collects relevant comments on key Christian concepts from prominent figures such as Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Clement of Rome, and Hippolytus. Includes key biblical verses associated with a given topic. Offers brief definitions of unfamiliar terms or concepts allowing easy access to the ancient material. Provides a who-who of the anti-Nicene Christianity to put in context the ancient Christian writers. Discusses more than 700 key theological, moral, and historical topics. Gives strategic cross-reference related topics. Functions as a topical index to the writings of the anti-Nicene fathers. David W. Burkott, an Anglican priest and an attorney, graduated from Stephen F. Austin State University and Baylor University School of Law. He is the author of... Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? And as a member of the North American Patristic Society. Hendrickson Publishers. <clears throat> Classified as theology or church history. <clears throat> so yeah, this is, I think, what I paid for it here. Um, 1997. I don't know what this would cost you now. You can probably hunt this down for a fairly good price. Um... Drink some of my coffee here. Uh, let's look at the inside of this book and see what it has to offer us. A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, a reference guide to more than 700 topics discussed by the early church fathers, David W. Burkott, editor. A table of Contents. How to use this dictionary. Who's who in the anti-Nicene fathers? Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs. <clears throat> so it appears to be in alphabetical order here. Who's who in the Anti-Nicene Fathers? As you see how things are categorized here. 
Let's look at this one here, Irenaeus. Bishop of the Church at Lyons in modern-day France. When he was a boy, Irenaeus had heard Polycarp teach. From this, it is generally supposed that Irenaeus was a native of Smyrna. In 190, Irenaeus wrote to the victor bishop of Rome pleading tolerance for the Christians of Asia Minor, who celebrated Easter on a different day than did Rome. He is classified herein as both Eastern and Western since he was from an Eastern background but ministered in the West. <clears throat> Justin Martyr 100 to 165, philosopher who converted to Christianity and became a tireless evangelist and apologist. Justin wrote more concerning Christianity than any other person prior to his time. He is classified herein as Eastern since he was a native of Samaria and his thought patterns were Eastern. However, he spent the last years of his life in Rome where he was executed as a martyr. See Justin Martyr herein. So let's look at what they're saying, how to use this dictionary. A dictionary of early Christian beliefs allows a user to quickly ascertain what the early Christians believed on over 700 different theological, moral, and historical topics, and it functions as an index to the writings of the anti-Nicene writers, specifically as collected in the 10-volume work of the anti-Nicene fathers. Why are the beliefs of these early Christian authors important? Because early Christian testimony holds that many, such as Clement of Rome and Polycarp, personally knew the apostles of Jesus. They were approved by the apostles and appointed by the apostles to positions of church leadership. Modern students of church history must largely depend on these and other early Christian writers for information on topics of major import, such as who wrote the New Testament, documents, and how the Christian canon of Scripture came into being. Furthermore, these Christians' interpretation of the Scriptures is among the most valuable commentary on Scripture anywhere. To be sure, none of these writers cl claimed di divine inspiration, nor did they equate their own writings with Scripture. They did, however, claim that they were faithfully passing along the faith that the apostles had delivered to the church. The essence of early Christianity. Users of this dictionary for, should first grasp the ethos of the early of early Christianity. That ethos can be summarized in two basic principles. One, the earliest Christians focused on living in the light of the Christian message and explaining that the message to non-believers, rather than on sharpening their theological prowess. And two, early Christian doctrine is less elaborate and less defined than later formulations. To say that the early Christians focused on living the gospel rather than on theological hair-splitting does not mean that individuals taught whatever they wanted. There were recognized boundaries that prevented such a laissez-faire attitude. Nonetheless, to the early Christians, the heart of their faith consisted of an obedient love relationship with Christ, not the ability to articulate dogma. None of the testimony of the writers in this volume arose from some professional theologians. Rather like the Apostle Paul, many lived in the trenches on the cutting edge of the Christian life, and in fact, a substantial number of these early Christian writers died as martyrs. The early church concentrated chiefly on the nature of Christian living because the essential core of Christian belief, i.e. the rule of faith, can be expressed quite briefly. The church believed that the Christian faith is a fairly simple one, Skipperian wrote. When I use the term early Christians or early church, I am referring to pre Nicene Christians and the pre-Nicene Church. The Anti-Nicene Fathers, edited by Alexander Roberts and James Donaldson, 1885-1887, through 1887. <clears throat> When the Word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, came unto all, he gathered alike the learned and unlearned. He published the teachings of salvation to each sex in every age. He made a concise summary of his teachings so that the memory of the scholars might not be burdened with the heavenly learning. Instead, we could quickly learn what was necessary to a simple faith. Echoing those sentiments, Lactanitis remarked, The secrets of the Most High God who created all things cannot be attained by our own ability and perceptions. 
Otherwise, there would be no difference between God and man if human thought could reach to the consuls and arrangements of that eternal majesty. Irenaeus criticized the heretics for going beyond the simple teachings of the faith, saying any form opinions on what is beyond the limits of understanding. For this cause also the apostle says, Be not wise in what is fitting to be wise, but be wise prudently. Working through a sample topic. So this shows you how to work through different topics. Um, and as I did read you um, a few short biographical remarks, you can also see that there is topics. This one is alms and almsgiving. An altar. Angels. Apostles 12. Apostolic faith. Arius and Arianism, atonement, I'm skipping around quite a bit, baptism, little bookmarker here, and my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That's a good download for me right there. Um, birthdays. Birth control, see procreation, birth of Jesus. Bishop, bishop, canon, New Testament, certificates of sacrifice, Christ, divinity of 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 Christian life, Christianity, Christianity, church, church government, church is apostolic. Church's apostolic definition, function, and importance. Church at Antioch, church at Corinth, church at Ephesus, church at Philippi, church at Rome. Church's apostolic conception, Constantine, creation, creeds of the early church. Crowns, days of creation, dead intermittent state of the death. What is death? Why humans die? Christian attitude towards death. What is death? According to the general sentiment of the human race, we declare death to be the debt of nature. This much has been settled by the voice of God, Tertullian. The operation of death is plain and obvious. It is the separation of body and soul, Tertullian. We define the first death in this manner. Death is the dissolution of nature of living things, or we can say that death is the separation of body and soul. Lactinitis. Why humans die. If a vessel being molded has some flaw in it, it is remolded or remade so that it, it can become new and entire. So also it happens to man by death. For somehow or other he is broken up that he may rise in the resurrection whole. I mean spotless, righteous, and immortal. Theophilus. God set a limit to man's sin by interposing death, for death causes sin to cease. It puts an end to the dissolution of the flesh. This dissolution should take place in the earth so that man ceasing at the length to live to sin and dying to it might begin to live to God, Irenaeus. Although the body is dissolved at the appointed time because of that original Disobedience, it is placed, as it were, in the cruci crucible of the earth to be recast again. When it is recast, it will not be as this corruptible body. Rather, it will be pure and no longer subject to decay. To each body, its own soul will be restored. Aranas. Deification of man. Demons, demon possession, demon possession, deuterocanonical deutero books, discipline of the church, dying of the hair, Easter, eighth day, equality of humankind, eternal punishment and rewards, evil problem of Father God, free will and predestination, heresies and heretics, hypostatic union, re let's see, incarnation, Jesus Christ, John, the Apostle, Law, Mosaic, Liturgy, Lord's Day, Man, Doctrine of, Martyrs, Martyrdom, Matthew, Millennium, Montanus, Mythology, Greek, Nuns, Ordination, 
Pacifism, parables of Jesus, parables of Jesus, parents, parenting, Paul the Apostle, perfection, the Christian, Peter, prayer, Pythagoras, reincarnation. <sighs> reincarnation, souls ne neither see God nor transmigrate into other bodies, for if they did, they would, n n uh, would know why they were punished, and they would be afraid to commit even the most trivial sin afterwards. Justin Marcher. The Gnostics deem it necessary, therefore, that by means of transmigration from body to body, soul should experience every kind of life. Irenaeus. We may subvert the Gnostics doctrine as to transmigration from body to body by this fact, that souls remember nothing whatever of the events which took place in their supposed previous states of existence. Irenaeus. Plato, that ancient Athenian, was the first to introduce this opinion, i.e. reincarnation. Irenaeus. The hypothesis of Basilides, a Gnostic teacher, says that the soul, having sinned before in another life, endures punishment in this life. Clement of Alexandria. How much more worthy of the acceptance is our belief that maintains that souls will return to the same bodies? And how much more ridiculous is your inherited pagan teaching that the human spirit is to reappear in a dog, mule, or peacock? Tertullian. It is sufficient that the no less important philosophy of Pythagoras, Empodocles, and the Platonists take the contrary view and declare that the soul is immortal. Moreover, they say that this is a way that most nearly approaches our own teaching, that the soul actually returns into bodies. However, according to the philosophers, it is not the same bodies, and it is not necessarily those of human beings, Tertullian. What does this mean that the ancient saying mentioned by Plato concerning the reciprocal migration of the souls, he says that they leave here and go yonder and then return here and pass through life, yet they again depart from this life and afterwards become alive from the dead? Some will have it that this is the saying of Pythagoras, Trichulian. Now our position is this, that the human soul cannot by any means at all be transferred to beasts, Trichulian. Homer, so dreamed in this, remembered that he was once a peacock. However, I cannot for my part believe poets, even when they are wide awake, Tertullian. Souls do not transmigrate into animals, rather they return to their own proper bodies. No belief, indeed, under the cover of heresy, has yet burst upon us that embodies any such extravagant fiction that the souls of the human being pass into the bodies of wild beasts, Tertullian. <clears throat> Resurrection of the Dead. Sabbath, salvation, salvation, schism, scriptures, singing, Socrates, sovereignty in the providence of God, theophany, type, typology, veil, and so we come to the end of this, but you get the gist. Um, there are several different topics, several short biographical notes on some of the early fathers and Christian thinkers. Um, let's see here. I wanted to look up one other thing um, here and see. Yes, very important right here. Beard. You will not shave around the sides of your head, nor will you disfigure the edges of your beard. Leviticus 19.27 nor will they shave the edges of their beards. Leviticus 21.5 The philosophers perform no useful service, yet they are not even willing to wear a long beard without being paid for it. Tassian What great and wonderful things have your philosophers effected? They have uncovered one of their shoulders. They let their hair grow long. They cultivate their beards. Tassian The hair of the chin showed him to be a man. Clement of Alexandria how womanly is it for one who is a man to comb himself and to shave himself with a razor for the sake of fine effects and to arrange his hair at the mirror, shave his cheek, pluck hairs out of them and smooth them. For God wished women to be smooth and to rejoice in their locks alone growing spontaneously as a horse in his mane. But he has adorned man like the lions with the beard and endowed him as an attribute for manhood with a hairy chest as a sign of strength in rule. Clement of Alexandria. This, then, is the mark of the man, the beard, 
by this he is seen to be a man. It is older than Eve. It is the token of superior nature, and it is therefore unholy to desecrate the symbol of manhood, hairiness. Clement of Alexandria. It is not lawful to pluck out the beard of man's natural and noble adornment. Clement of Alexandria. Let the chin have the hair, for an ample beard suffices for men. If someone too shaves part of his beard, it must not be made entirely bare, for this is a disgraceful sight. The mustache similarly, which is dirtied and eating, is to be cut round, not by the razor, for that is not well bred, but by a pair of cropping scissors. But the hair on the chin is not to be disturbed. Clement of Alexandria. This sex of ours acknowledges to itself deceptive trickeries of form particularly of its own, such as to cut the beard too sharply, to pluck it out here and there, to shave around the mouth, Tertullian. In their manners there was no discipline, and the men with their beards were defaced, Scyprian. Although it is written, you will not mar the figure of your beard, he plucks out his beard and dresses his hair, Scyprian. The beard must not be plucked, you must not deface the figure of your beard, Leviticus 19.32, Scyprian. The nature of the beard contributes in an incredible degree to distinguish the maturity of bodies and distinguish the sex or to contribute to the beauty of manliness and strength. Lactanitus. Men may not destroy their hair or their beards as unnaturally change the form of the man. For the law says you will not deface your beards, for God the Creator has made this decent for women, but as determined it is not unsuitable for men. Apostolic Constitutions. See also Gurming. So you get the point there of what kind of topics can be covered. There's many, many, many topics covered. The, a Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, a reference guide to more than 700 topics discussed by the early church fathers. David W. Barakat, editor. This has been Justin William Savoy. Thank you for joining me today. You, I can be reached, as always, at SavoyJustin123 at gmail.com. I look forward to providing more content for you, and I will post some more material soon. Peace.